Hello, everybody. We're going to discuss today the chapters from Alma 23 through 29 for this week's Come Follow Me readings. A little background, just historical context and a little bit of content today. We are about 90 to 79 years before the birth of the Savior, so it's possible that people who were born during these chapters could be alive when the Savior was born. Uh, they would have to be really, really, really old if they were able to be around when the Savior actually appeared to the Nephites. But we're getting closer to that group of people, that generation there. Just to review, uh, we've had uh, Aaron and Ammon and Omner and Himni serve missions to the Lamanites. They have left the Nephite land and have spent many, many years uh, preaching the gospel. We reviewed that Ammon taught King Lamoni. And with a wonderful story that not only did he convert King Lamoni, but he had a, uh, an interaction with King Lamoni's father, who was king over all of the Nephite land. And Aaron had the privilege of teaching uh, King Lamoni's father and converted his household with that miraculous story in Alma 22 that we discussed last week. And not only these four brothers, uh, sons of Mosiah, but there were many others that we just don't know how many and all of their names. Some good stuff in there. So let's go to chapter 23 to begin. At the beginning of this, because of this missionary work and this conversion of King Lamoni and his father, King Lamoni's father is going to send a proclamation out through all the land saying, hey, let these missionaries teach. Leave them alone. Uh, don't persecute them. And they have great success. In fact, how much success do they have? It says in verse 5, this is Alma 23, verse 5, thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Now, not only were they converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they were brought to a believe in the traditions of the Nephites. And they were taught the records and prophecies which were handed down even unto the present time. So they not only had to be converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they had to be taught true history. Because much of their behavior and their attitudes and actions were passed down through false history. Which maybe we see a lot of that today. If we teach true history, what really happened, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, thousands can be converted. If you go to verse 7. Uh, well, actually, the end of verse 6, let's look at that. As many of the Lamanites believed on their preachings, were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. I, I think here as a family, you can make a little list. What's the difference between having a testimony and becoming converted? A testimony is definitely having knowledge. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I know the Book of Mormon is true. Well, I know lots of people who know that, but they don't act upon it. They don't go to church. They don't make and keep sacred covenants. So knowledge is not enough. Conversion is different in here. Maybe you can make a list of what does it mean to be converted to the point where you will never fall away. Now let's go to verse 7. This group of people became a righteous people and did lay down their weapons of their rebellion. And they did not fight against God anymore, neither against any of their brethren. Uh, so this is really a, a powerful group. And if we go down to verse... Uh, verse 14, we learn that the Amalekites were not converted, save only one, and neither were any of the Amulonites. So we have this large group of Lamanites, thousands of them, that are converting to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but none of, except one, none of the apostates convert. I, I think this says where our heart's at, uh, and fighting against this. Now, they want to, in verse 16, take upon themselves a new name. And verse 17 says, the name will be Anti-Nephi-Lehi. So I wanted to make sure we understood what that meant. Uh, we really don't know, to be honest with you. However, there are some inclinations. The Egyptian name of the word anti comes from a word anti, N-T-Y, which means the one of. So here's a group of people that are one of. Now, it's interesting that they combine the two words, Nephi and Lehi. It's almost as if this group is trying to create a, a bridge to connect these two. We are one of the Nephi's 
and the Lamanites, Lehi's children and Nephi's children. We want to be combined. Uh, it's really interesting here that they want to change their name. They want to make a new name for themselves, which we've talked many of these weeks about what it means to take a, a new name upon us. So let's go over to chapter 24 now. Again, this week there's seven chapters. Let's start our second of the seven chapters. 24, the verse 1. And it came to pass that the Amalekites and the Amulonites and the Lamanites, who were in the land of Amulon and also in the land of Helam, who also were in the land of Jerusalem, and in fine in all the land round about, who had not been converted. So we're talking all the Lamanites who aren't converted, especially the apostates were stirred up by the Amalekites and by the Amulonites to anger against their brethren. So if you don't convert to the gospel of Jesus Christ and join this group, the apostates are trying to uh, help you become angry and mad and, and rile you up to go fight your fellow brethren, which they end up doing. So... In fact, go to verse 2. Their hatred became exceedingly sore against them, that insomuch that they began to rebel against their king. Remember, their king is converted. So they're like fighting against the king. If you're not, if you're going to convert and join, we're going to rebel against you and we're going to do what we want. It's interesting at the end of verse 2, they take up arms against this people. But verse 3, I think, might have some insight of what the king is trying to do here. The king conferred upon the kingdom upon his son and called his name Anti-Nephi-Lehi. He is trying to send a message. We want to combine. We want to unite. We want to be of this larger group. But the apostates will have nothing to do with it. And in verse 4, they make pre preparations for warfare. But we've learned here that they don't fight these these recent converts refuse to fight. I, I think there's some reasons why in here. If you go to verse 9, it talks about their sin, their past sins, which at the end of verse 9, many murders which we have committed. They're afraid that if they start committing their past sins that they won't be able to stop again. I think this is a sign of true conversion. Is there a past sin that a convert has that they're like, I cannot go back? It could be an addiction. It could be a certain lifestyle. You can't go back to those things because you might not uh, come back. For it. That's true conversion. I'm going to bury that past lifestyle. And they do. Well, so they go to fight. And how many? Verse 22 tells us exactly the exact number of these recent converts were killed. 1,005. Now, the Lamanites stop killing their brother, and they're like, okay, this is ridiculous. We're killing our own people. They're just converted. And, in fact, so many of them are touched by the willingness to sacrifice their own life for their belief that many join the church. And verse 27 tells us more were converted than were killed. So we don't know how many, but more than a 1,005 ended up being converted. So again, how many people were converted? Thousands. But a thousand gets killed, but more than a thousand joined. So there is a large group of this Lamanite. This is a successful missionary endeavor by the sons of Mosiah here. So let's go to uh, in chapter 25. Chapter 25 starts out with the apostates are so angry that this group of Lamanites go invade a Nephite land. And where do they go? Well, they go to, at the end of verse 2, Ammoniah, and they destroy that city. Well, that is the story back from Alma 16. Remember, we had these wicked people that, that uh, uh, Alma was teaching, and Amulek taught, and they rejected them. They killed the righteous or kicked them out of their city and they all left. So now we have this completely wicked city. So now we put the two pieces to the puzzle together. These completely uh, irate apostates get these Lamanites who don't convert to go attack the Nephites. And the one city they attack is this group. So this reminds me of how does the Lord allow so many wicked people to be killed? If you go to Mormon... 
in the Book of Mormon. I'm going to let you turn there because I think it's really that good. If you go to Mormon, uh, the fourth chapter. Mormon, chapter 4. And then go to verse 5. It reads, But behold, the judgments of God will overtake the wicked. And it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. For it is the wicked that stir up the hearts of the children of men unto bloodshed. Well, that is exactly what just happened here. We have these wicked apostates stirring up those that refuse to convert to, to wickedness to go attack. And who do they end up killing? It was the wicked Nephites. So there is just uh, another story. And I think we see that today. Maybe there's a group of very wicked people stirring up a larger group of people who uh, just want to go do destruction. And who are they going to destroy? Well, they're destroying wicked areas and things. Now, do good people get mixed in that? There's no doubt that they do. But I think there is some truth with that scripture. Okay, let's go to verse, uh, well, chapter 25 still, Alma 25. There's one more little uh, story in here that almost gets hidden. And it goes back to, way back to King Noah, wicked King Noah, that Abinadi came and preached to wicked King Noah and said, repent. And Noah doesn't. And his priests are horribly wicked. And they tell Noah, don't, don't listen to this guy. Let's kill him. Alma is the only one that listens and he takes off. But shortly after this story, we know that the Lamanites come in and attack King Noah's and his people. And King Noah has this brilliant strategy. Run. And King Noah and all of these men run. They say, leave the women and children. And they finally get out in the wilderness. And the people are like, King Noah, what's our plan? He's like, well, as long as we're safe, that's fine. And most of the people are like, we left our wives and children. So what do they do? They burn King Noah which was a prophecy that Abinadi said, whatever you do to me is going to happen to you and your wicked priests. So Amulon is the leader of these wicked priests, and Amulon and the wicked priests take off. Noah gets killed, and they go back. But these wicked priests have been wandering out here in the wilderness for some time. Remember, they abducted the Lamanite daughters. They eventually find Alma and his converted people and harass them until Alma's people escape by a miracle. But Amulon and these wicked priests, their descendants have still survived until chapter 25. So what happens in 25? Well, look at, look at verse 4. And among the Lamanites who were slain were almost all of the seed of Amulon and his brethren, who were the priests of Noah, and they were slain by the hands of the Nephites. So the story of people who were wicked that seemed to escape, we rarely hear the end of that story. We're like, oh, wicked people get away from it. We watch movies where criminals steal things and we almost cheer them on and we hope that they get away from it. But rarely do we find the end of the story. Here we find the end of these wicked priests and their posterity uh, gets destroyed. So let's go to chapter 26 now. Ch chapter 26 is a great little recap. This is almost like a missionary returning from his mission and reporting on the, the success they had and the glory of God in helping them. And... Thousands of these Lamanites have been converted, and he rejoices over that. He basically tells the story of Mission Impossible. We served a mission, and with the Lord's help, we did the, that which, which, which was impossible. Okay, chapter 27. Chapter 27. The Lamanites finally returned to the land of Nephi. Now we're, we're wondering, okay, what are we going to do with all of these new converts? In verse 2, it tells us that the apostates again are building up anger amongst the Lamanites. And so what's going to happen? Well, there's more killing. There's more wars. Uh, it's not a pleasant sight. So we have to get these people out of here because they're, they're willing, they're refusing to fight. Uh, they don't want to return to their past sins. So in verse 5, there's a plan that says, why don't we take them back to the land of Zarahemla? And let's live amongst the Nephites. So there's two uh, steps in this strategy. Someone comes up with an idea. And then in verse 7, they say, Ammon, 
Why don't you go pray? So verse 7, Ammon says, I will go and inquire of the Lord. And if he say unto us, go down unto our brethren, will you go? No, yeah, we'll go. So they have a plan. They're going to go ask the Lord if it's okay. Then they're going to carry it out. But it doesn't end right there. So verse 12, the Lord says, okay, yeah, take these people. Get them out of here. We're going to separate these apostate Nephites and these new converts. we got to separate them. So verse 12, the Lord says, get them out of here. I will preserve them. So they're going to get them out of there. But verse 15 is what's really interesting here. And it came to pass that Ammon said unto them, Behold, I and my brethren will go forth into the land of Zarahemla, and we shall, and ye shall remain here until we return. And we will try the hearts of our brethren, whether they will, that ye shall come into their land. In other words, they're not just going to march into Zarahemla. They want to go in and ask the people. They're going to try their hearts. Okay, we have a group of converts. In fact, thousands of them. Will you allow them to come into our land? Are, are your hearts prepared enough to willingly accept this group of, of immigrants? And the people do. But their response in verse 22 says something really interesting. They're like, yeah, we would be willing to let them. But we're not going to let them just have one in every home. We want them to have their own land, their own people, their own group. So they give them a land. In this case, in verse 22, it's called Jershon. Brigham Young did this. When converts came, he didn't scatter them across the territory. He put them together in groups. For example, a lot of the Scandinavians came in together. So what did he do? He put them in, in San Pete County, or he put them in their own little uh, their groups and scattered them around. We see this in, in big cities too. New York City is known as the melting pot. Well, they really don't melt together. We have a little Italy. We have a Greek town. We have a Chinatown, right? Similar here is they're like, we're just going to give you your own town so you can have your own, your own land. And it's great. Now, go to chapter 28. So there are all of these converts are now in the general land of the Nephites in the land of Zarahemla. And in chapter 28, we see that and verse 1, they're established. But verse 2 shows that the Lamanites come in and there's a massive battle. I want to read verse 2 because I think this will say something about this battle. Okay, chapter 20, uh, 28, verse 2. And thus there was a tremendous battle, yea, even such and one as never had been known among the pe all the people in the land from the time Lehi left Jerusalem. Yea, and tens of thousands of the Lamanites were slain and scattered abroad. Verse 3, And there was also, there was a tremendous slaughter among the people of Nephi. Nevertheless, the Lamanites were driven and scattered. Okay, th this is a bold statement. We're now 500 years plus of Nephite history. Nephite, Lamanite history. And at this point in that one verse, they sum up, this is the greatest battle that's ever been fought. And that's all we have about it. Tens of thousands of Lamanites are killed. And remember, they've already had thousands convert to the Nephites. Now tens of thousands have been killed. The Lamanites have been completely uh, humbled uh, group of people because of this missionary experience. Whether it's the tens of thousands that lose their lives in these battles, the thousands that have converted, the thousand and five that convert and they get killed by their own people, the Lamanites are now a different people. I think that leads into what's about to happen, where the Lamanites will now become a, a righteous people. So let's take a look at, well, I think that's sufficient for right now with this. Uh, verse 9, chapter 28, verse 9, shares, us, shares with us that we're only 15 years away from when Mosiah was the last king and started the system, the reign of the judges. But let's go to verse 13. I want to just say a couple things about these last couple of verses. We have to remember the context of who's writing this. This is Mormon. Mormon is taking this thousand years of history that he has, and he's choosing parts that he feels, as he's mentioned in his purpose, will bring us closer to the Savior. We're going to learn about the Savior and his kingdom. And he puts in here, uh, a phrase that Mormon uses often, and thus we see. 
In other words, he's telling why he told the story. So in verse 13, he tells why he told the story. And thus we see how great the inequality of man is. Why is there inequality? Some people say, well, it's because of selfishness or greed. Maybe it's laziness or maybe it's, well, all of those words can be summed up with Mormon's three words. Because of sin and transgression. And the power of the devil, which comes by the cunning plans which he has devised to ensnare the hearts of men. So if we look around the world today, is there really enough? Yeah, the Doctrine and Covenant says the earth has enough and to spare. There's plenty. If we would all work hard and live the principles of the gospel and share, the rich don't wouldn't decrease in their riches. The poor wouldn't remain poor. We would all increase and have sufficient for our needs and our wants. But sin separates us from that on both sides. So let's look at verse 14. Here's another statement by Mormon that he wants us to learn. And thus we see the great call of diligence of men to labor in the vineyards of the Lord. And thus we see the great reason of sorrow and also of rejoicing. Sorrow because of death and destruction among men and joy because of the light of Christ unto life. We see that today. Is there not a great need for missionary work? Is there not a great need to re uh, sorrow because of death and destruction that's around us? But yet, at the same time, is there not a great need to rejoice because of the light of Jesus Christ and the massive building of temples and missionary work and ordinances that are being done? You can imagine what the world would have been like in, in Zarahemla with all of these new converts uh, making covenants and so forth. So to end... Chapter 29, what does Alma do? Alma declares some wonderful words here that he wishes he were an angel. And I, my concluding thing here is, in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sang a song, Oh, that I were an angel. Uh, they sing the words to Alma 29, verse 1. Uh, maybe you can find that uh, song. Maybe it's in YouTube or something. You can go and listen to that. It's a great song that you can listen to. I hope you enjoyed this. Next week, we will discuss Alma 30 and 31, only two chapters, but they're powerful chapters. We'll see you next week.